Do you see my screen? Yes, uh, perfect. Okay. No, I think that's the intention. Okay, um, people seem to be back. Um, so it's a pleasure to announce the third lecture by Gaëtan. Um, okay, well, mini course, I forgot the title, but anyway. Okay, go ahead. Thanks, Reimar. So before starting, I have an announcement. There is going to be a special issue of Journal of Geometry and Physics. Uh, which um, so we're editing with uh, Bertrand Enard, Danilo Levansky, and Elba Garcia Failde. And um, it will concern everything that has to do from close or from far with topological recursion, so both theory and applications. Um, and so you're, well, there will be in this uh, special issue, there are going to be surveys on different aspects of topological recursion and different fields where it was used like gromov witten theory, random matrices, uh, hopefully random tensors, uh, innovative geometry, algebraic geometry, and so on. And also there's going to be some research articles. So um, I want to take this occasion to, to, to say that you're very welcome to submit there uh, any work that you've done, which may have a little bit of topological recursion or it may be related to it. And it's going to be reviewed as a normal issue of the journal. So we do a serious reviewing process, but we welcome any sort of work uh, in this topic from far or from close. So, and now I will go back to the lecture. So what do I do to switch? So now we switch. So today I'm going to talk about loop equations and topological recursion. And I want to start to remind the first Schrodinger Dyson equation that we got yesterday for this uh, matrix model with double trace, and uh, especially of the, the leading order of the Schrodinger Dyson equation, which was only an equation involving w01, so the leading order of w1. Uh, it was looking like this, where this t01 tilde was analytic near the real axis, and this p also was analytic. And in when the case where the t's were actually polynomial, this p would actually be a polynomial. So yesterday we've seen that it implies that W01 has, is going to have discontinuities on um, a collection of segments on the real line. And also what it tells us is that if you look at W01 when X approaches the real axis, and this you can do from two sides, either from the with positive, small positive imaginary part or a small negative imaginary part. So this boundary values here, the way we solved this equation yesterday tells us that actually this boundary value exists. And moreover, let us take the discontinuity of the equation. So this equation here, that means I evaluate it at x plus, 
And then I do minus the evaluation at X minus. So what I will get for the square, I'm going to get a factorization in terms of W01X plus W01X minus W01X plus W01X minus. So it comes from this term. Then this continuity of this, when X goes to the real line, so we said this T tilde 0, 01 prime is analytic near R. So it just stays in front, and then I just had the discontinuity of W01. And then the P is analytic near R. This means in particular, it's continuous across the real line, so it disappears. So we arrive to this equation. And for all X, which is on the support of the eigenvalues, so this union of segments, this quantity here, precisely we say W01 has a discontinuity. So this is non-zero. Therefore, you find that these terms, the sum of these terms is going to vanish. And this is valid on any at any discontinuity point for W01. So the situation is the following. You have the complex plane, which is the X plane. And here you have those segments. And this equation tells you what happens when you approach um, the cut either from above or from below. It relates these two limit values. So their sum is equal to minus T01 till that prime. Now imagine I just focus on this little segment. I can use all the power of complex analysis. Um, so I can do a little transform conformal transformation by writing. So if this is A and B, I can define x of z to be a plus b half plus a minus b over four z plus one over z and it's going to bring me this little neighborhood here so the cut gets mapped to the unit disk and in fact the upper side of the cut gets mapped to the upper unit disk uh, upper unit circle and the lower part so that's x plus i0, x minus i0. And here, what I'm drawing is the z plane. Uh, sorry, Gaetan, one question. Uh, yes. Yeah, so does the nature of convergence changes if you uh, are on the edge of each interval? Yes. So, um, so if you start, so here, what we did, we first approach, we first send n to infinity. Yeah. And then we get this analytic function with cuts. Um, and if you send then the point X towards the edge, you're going to get the square root behavior. I see. However, I see. if you were putting from the start, so for the n finite case, some Xn that approaches the edge at a certain rate, yes. and then you want to take the limit, uh -huh. that's what you want to do to study the universal behavior of local statistics in random matrices. Yes. Uh, and then things change dramatically. I see. So it's sensitive in this approach too. Okay, very good. It is absolutely sensitive to uh, which order yeah. you take the limits. Yes, yes, yes. And what I discuss here, I mean, what topological regression mm -hmm. mostly has to do is first you take the larger limit, then you can approach the edges. And so this is in the bulk, more or less. Um, no, no, because the bulk would be, you put something here. In the middle. So you cannot study directly in this way, double scaling limits. Okay, yeah. It's a subtle issue. I see, okay. Uh -huh. Thank you, yeah. So with this map here, X of Z, from the Z plane to the X plane, this what I 
wrote in gray is going to be a neighborhood of the outside of the unit disk. And this equation, if I write everything in terms of Z, is going to say, so if you have a Z here, which corresponds to a certain X plus I zero, then in fact, one over Z is the same value of X, but when you approach the unit disk, it corresponds to X minus I zero. So this equation tell you that if I do the abuse of notation that now I consider the W as functions of Z, that you have this equation. And this is now for any Z in this unit disk. And I stress again that this term here is analytic, it was analytic near R. So in terms of Z, it's analytic in the neighborhood of this unit circle. Therefore, I can use this equation to define an analytic continuation of the W01 inside the unit disk, at least in some neighborhoods of the unit circle, which I here draw in, in green. If you want to go further down, well, you may hit some singularities of the T tilde prime zero one. So uh, at least I want it in the neighborhood. So this is, if you want, that's a sort of application of a Schwartz principle. Okay. So why are we doing that? It's because we don't really like to work with functions that square root singularities. We prefer to work with their analytic continuation on the Riemann surface. Um, and this I've done in for this card, but I could also do it here. So somehow I would have uh, the spectral curve, which is the Riemann surface on which you can continue W01 essentially looks like this. Where you went a bit in, you opened up the cut and you could go a bit, you could continue W01 a bit inside. And the W01 is defined on this striped surface. So that's, um, yeah. And the thing I want to point is that now what happens with square roots when you have a square root like this, in fact, this is A minus B over four, Z minus one over Z. And these points here is equal one, Z equal minus one. correspond to x equal a or b, so the endpoints of segments. And so you see that these square roots, z is a local coordinate on the Riemann surface. And when you have a function that has a square root, its analytic continuation on the Riemann surface is going to have a zero at the corresponding point. In particular, if I do dx, differential form, it's main a minus b over four, y minus one over z squared dz. And so this has z as a local coordinate. And so you see that this has a simple zero at z equal plus or minus one. The analysis which I've explained here for W01, you can redo that for all the other Schrodinger equations. So all the Schrodinger equations in the larger expansion can be recursively analyzed recursively on 2G minus two plus N.
to find that in fact this double equation is true for any gn so you have that for any x in s and then x2 xn which are away from the cut then wgn x plus x2 xn plus wgn x minus x2 xn plus this contour integral dtx t01 x psi 2 wgn psi 2 this is equal to well, in the zero one case you already see it that was equal to minus t prime zero one here it was zero two sorry if you do it for g equals zero n equal two you would find one over x minus x two squared and otherwise you find nothing So that's by looking at the discontinuity of those Schrodinger equations. So they looked complicated at the start, in fact. So here they were, the higher order Schrodinger equations. We don't want to insert the expansion of Wn when n is large. And then we collect term with a given power of n. So we get relation between Ws and we compute discontinuity of this. Um, and one find this. And by the same analysis, it proves that Wgn can be continued analytically. on the same Riemann surface sigma. So again, I use this Schwartz principle. And there's a further equation that you, you can get. So this is what we would call the linear loop equation. And analyzing further the, the Schrodinger equations, um, they can uh, bring them in the form where you have, so for any x, well, yeah, I need to write like this so that w. So I can do analytic continuation. So I'm doing again this abyssal notation where I use the Z coordinates near and these unit disks. And I'm going to use, so there's a point Z here and parameterized by Z. Which correspond to some x and inside here when I open up the cut there's another point which I did not sigma z and there's one such near each branch point in fact and they assert that x of z is x of sigma z so here for instance sigma z was just one over z so because of the square root there's two points on the Riemann surface which when x approaches one of these endpoints um there's um two points which have the same value of x that collide so we have this sigma which is the local involution and so instead of writing x plus x minus i can write everything in terms of z and sigma z mm -hmm. and so you can rewrite the schrodinger equations in this way
it is g plus g prime and so h plus h prime is g so here this is h there's the genus or the order of expansion sigma z of j prime and this so if you forget about the sigma if i just add x and x that's what you would get all these terms when you take this first line here and look at the coefficient of n to the 2 minus 2 g minus i think uh, n um, plus 1. you would see a w so i shifted n by 1 so it's w n plus 1 g minus 1 and then you get product of w and the, the g of expansion that you take here and here just add up. But then of course there's many other terms and essentially up to little things, which I'm not going to explain here, um, you find that this is in fact holomorphic when z goes to an endpoint. Whereas the WGN themselves are meromorphic with poles when some of the ZI go to an endpoint. So that's what comes out of the analysis. So sorry, uh, get another yeah. question. So just wanted to make sure the nature of this Riemann surface. I mean, is it like double covering of an open subset of C? Is that? Uh... Um, so it's, let's say it's a complex curve. Yeah, is it um, compact? Is it compact? It's not necessarily compact. That's why I didn't want to complete here inside the unit disk. Yeah. Um, so it is the vicinity of the ramification points in a double cover. Okay, so it's like a hyper elliptic curve with some punctures or something. If the T01, if there was no T02 and T01 was polynomial, that would be a hyper elliptic curve. Yeah, okay. In that case, that would be compact. Yeah. As soon as you have T02, it's going, in fact, to be non compact. Okay, always. Thank you. But at least locally, you have your the first sheet here with your cuts. You up, and up, you up and up your cut, so you go to another sheet here, here as well, here as well. So these are connected. And that's what you see. And then you can try to maximally, maximally analytically continue that. In some cases, it might be hyperelliptic. In some other cases, it might just be non compact. And somehow I don't really need to see the full surface when I maximally continue. I just need to see the vicinity of this, what happens when I cross those cuts here. Um, I have also one question, Gaetan, um, about the sigma of Z. So the Galois involution, sometimes yes. called. It seems that if Z approaches the the circle that sigma z approaches the same point but i thought that sigma g would be on the lower side of the circle the so inside. the involution in this local model it's z goes to one over z yeah so sigma z approaches z exactly when z plus is plus or minus one that means the endpoints yes so if z approaches the circle from above the sigma z would approaches the circle from inside below. Okay. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So this is called the quadratic loop equation. And that will be our starting point. So that was one and then two, I want to talk about abstract loop equations. 
So somehow the key point is that you only need to look at this linear loop equation and quadratic loop equation to be able to solve for WGN in good situations. So here I have the word abstract. I want to distinguish this loop equation from Schrodinger's equation. They're not the same, but they can. They are implied in the matrix model. The loop equations are implied by the Schrodinger's equations. So when I talk about abstract loop equation, I want to consider this now independently of any matrix model, where I have sigma. So the setting is that sigma is a complex curve. X is a meromorphic function. So that is going to be, so if it were the matrix model, that would be the spectral curve. Then with this X, is the spectral curve presented as a branch cover. So at least locally, it's there's two sheets, locally degree two. Then we want to consider the zeros of dx. And we're going to assume they are simple and they're finitely many. And in the matrix model that correspond to the image in the spectral curve, the endpoints of segments. And assume that omega zero one, which is a one form, I can say holomorphic one form on sigma, and omega zero two, which is a this fundamental by differential of the second kind. So it's meromorphic. So it depends on two variables on the curve. It has a double pole at Z1 equals Z2 and should behave locally when Z1 goes to Z2 as dz1 over dz2 over z1 minus z2 squared. We're here, so I also abuse notations. Z here are points on a spectral curve. When I write this, I'm, I mean that I've, chose a loc I've chosen local coordinates. Good. So in the matrix model, the correspondence is that you want that omega zero one is w01 the function times dx that was existing that was analytic on the spectral curve and omega02 is so when i write this i really mean the analytic continuation the left hand side is the analytic continuation on sigma of what of the right hand side And it is a, a little lemma using the linear loop equation here for zero two to check that this is indeed the probability which I brought on the left-hand side. It's indeed the fundamental by differential of the second kind. So I take a setting like in the left-hand side, maybe it doesn't come from matrix model. And um, if we have a collection of omega GNs with index by G, non-negative integer N 
positive integers. And the thing that we don't have yet are all the one with two G minus two plus N strictly positive. And you are interested in such object which are meromorphic forms in each ZI in N variable with poles when one of the ZI approaches the zeros of the X. So we say that such a data satisfies abstract loop equations if you have the linear loop equation, which here is defined by saying that omega g n z z2 z n plus omega g n sigma z z2 z n has a simple zero when z approaches um, zero of the x. So these are called ramification points. And since I assume, I assume they are simple, it means that X behaves as, so when Z goes to A, you can always find a local coordinate so that X behaves like this. And therefore you have Sigma of Z. So there's exactly two sheets meeting. So locally two values of Z, which give the same X. So in this local coordinate, you have this involution exchanging these two values. So in this local coordinates, it's just Z goes to minus Z. It's defined locally. And you ask that this combination, this symmetrization of omega gn in one variable with respect to sigma, also omega gn may be meromorphic. This combination has no pull at Z goes, when Z approaches the zeros of the X. And even more, it has a simple zero. And the second condition, so you want this for all GN. And you have the quadratic loop equation, which is asking that omega GN plus one Z sigma of Z, Z to ZN. So that's the sum over H and H prime summing up to G, sum of always a splitting these variables, and then omega H one plus G, J, Z, J, omega H prime one plus J prime, sigma Z, J prime. So this is in respect to Z, it's, uh, it behaves like DZ squared. So it's a quadratic differential and you have it as a double, it must have a double zero. When Z goes to A. So this is a definition. And in the matrix model, indeed these two things are satisfied because of those linear and quadratic loop equations. Um, so these functions here are holomorphic when Z goes to an endpoint, which correspond to our ramification points here. And, but then when you did that, you in fact make um, these WGN differential forms. So you multiply by dx1, dxn, And uh, dx has a zero at these uh, points in big A. And since that's a quadratic differential, you get dx squared. Therefore, you get a double zero here and a simple zero here. So here's only one z, so it's only dx of z. So in the matrix model, this plus this shift for zero two satisfies the abstract loop equations.
I have one more question. Yes. Uh, so these WGNs originally were like functions. Yes. Now we are promoting them to sections of some bundles. So exactly. this, this is a bit uh, risky. I mean, we, one should check something, right? You So you take this function, you multiply by dx. And that's the way you go from functions to... This uh, is so, but in the local coordinates, I mean, transformation properties of functions and sections are very different. I mean, yes, however, the x in the setting x is already a meromorphic function globally defined on the curve. Uh, so you fix that from beginning, I see. That's part of the setting. Yeah, okay, yeah, this is important. Thank you, yeah. And in the matrix model, you get this X for free just by definition of the spectral curve that gives you the branch covering presenting yes. the spectral. Yes, yes, yes. It should be part of that also. Yeah, okay. Okay. And now we can talk about solving this using topological recursion. So I need one more notion is that if I have some phi or maybe not phi f, which is a meromorphic one form on the spectral curve with poles only at the zeros of the X, I'm going to define an operator when applied to it, it gives another meromorphic one form and it's defined by taking the residue at all poles of the primitive of omega zero to respect to one variable. So here I integrate from A to the point Z and that Z zero is a spectator variable. So now this is a locally defined function on Sigma and to take the residue, I need to apply it to a one form. So I put F of E. So computing the residue in Z leaves me with a one form in the variable Z zero. And likewise, I define HF to be, maybe I can say simply that as an operator, I define H to be identity minus P. So omega zero two from the start, we see it as a double point coinciding point. So this is something that when Z zero goes to close to Z, it behaves like this, but there's of course other terms. So you can think of this as a, the right-hand side of Cauchy residue formula, but not with the one over Z minus Z zero because we don't necessarily work over C, but we work over a spectral curve. So we replace that by the primitive of omega zero two. And so the, the properties of omega zero two to have this double pole imply that P and H are projectors. So P is projection on the polar part. So if you want a divergent part and H is a projection on the holomorphic part in the sense that H F <coughs> is holomorphic at the possible poles of F. So it's holomorphic on sigma. So in general, if you have a meromorphic one form on the Riemann surface, there's not a canonical way to split it into a, a part that contains the pole and the holomorphic part. Omega zero two, by its probability, give you a way to do that. And so the holomorphic part is then defined as identity minus this formula, and then the rest has the same behavior, divergent behavior at the poles than F. So the last remark I need is in the above 
matrix model, I mean, the matrix model we studied. If we are either in the one cut situation <coughs> or in the multi cut situation, but you fix the number of eigenvalue per cut. Um, then, in fact, H of omega G n. So omega G n depend on n variables, and this operator H act on only on one variable. So I'm going to write it like this. Is zero. So it's something you can prove. So in other words. It means that omega g n, you can write it as p acting on the variable z1 of omega g n. And you think of that as a Cauchy residue formula. Adapted to our problem. Because it tells you if you want to reconstruct omega gn as a globally defined meromorphic form on the on the surface, you can write it as this p. And what is this p? It's the sum at the of residues at the poles of a certain Cauchy kernel times omega gn. So it allows to reconstruct omega gn from its local behavior at the poles. Okay. So now is the core computation. Imagine I take a collection of omega g and that solve abstract loop equations. I'm going to write that omega g n. So this plus it is normal, it is normalized in the sense that we have this. Any of these two properties are equivalent. So I'm going exactly to write that omega gn z1 zn is the sum of residues at the possible poles of omega gn of something I will call gzz1 omega gn z z to the n where g is the primitive so maybe I can write g a because I can take the primitive yeah, between A and Z of omega zero two. And I want, I'm going to say, I want to actually find the omega gen in terms of the omega G prime and prime with two G prime minus two plus N prime smaller than two G minus two plus N. So essentially I want to solve the loop equations. So here's how it works. You first symmetrize this using sigma. So this sigma of A is A because A is a fixed point of this involution. You get just a residue at Z equal A again. So I don't want to write all the time these all these variables, so I just call that I. They're going to be spectator. Okay. And um, now let me introduce, if I were one form, I introduce two operators which do the anti-symmetrization and the symmetrization.
And if I have a product of functions, so F1, F2, so if I have F1 of Z, F2 of Z, I mean, I can write like this. If I have S of a product of functions, which is exactly the case here, this is S of in Z of G, A, Z, Z1, omega, G, and Z, I. This you can write as a half of F, S, F1, S, F2 plus delta F1, delta F2. It's a polarization form. So we're going to do this. So we see one over four now, S of G, A, Z, Z, one. So the Z just indicates here that I'm acting on this variable, while the other one remains spectator. S, Z of omega, G, N, Z, I, and then the deltas. The anti-symmetric ones. And now you use the linear loop equation. And the linear loop equation, we come back to them. They exactly tell you that S of omega gn, also omega gn was meromorphic. This combination is a symmetric combination has a simple zero, so it's holomorphic. So it tells us it's holomorphic. But if it's holomorphic, it doesn't contribute to the residue. So that's residue term is going to vanish. I'm only left with the product of deltas. And now the quadratic loop equation. So if I have something like this, f of z, f1 of z, f2 of sigma z, that's the kind of thing we have in the quadratic loop equations, which are. Uh, wait, which are here. So here we have uh, F1, F2, and F1 of Z, F2 of sigma Z. I also want to write that in terms of deltas and S. And so this is going to be a half of S of F1, S of F2, so S of F2 minus delta F1, delta F2. So the quadratic loop equation Let's have a closer look at it. So here it is. And we want to, it's going, it's going to involve some omega gn. And we're going to isolate the term that contain omega gn. So here we have an omega g minus one and plus one. So it's not this one. And here we could have H equal G and J is the full set of variables that would be an omega G N. But then J prime is empty and the H prime must be zero. So here we have at least a term omega G N omega zero one. So I write it here. And since it comes with Z and Sigma Z, I have two possibilities, either this one or this one. Okay. And then what remains, I'm going to call it E. And the E, it contains everything else which was not an omega gn. So it was omega g minus one and plus one z sigma z.
and this product here. where there is no omega gen and also, I mean, no omega zero one. Omega gen always come with omega zero one. So you just exclude this term. And this I can write as, given the little remark I had before, as a half of S Z omega gen S Z omega zero one minus a half of delta Z omega G N delta Z omega zero one plus E. <coughs> um, it's not equal to zero. It was just as a double zero. when z goes to one of the zeros of the x. So we did that because we had in our expression for omega gn, we had delta, it expressed in the delta omega gn. So we're going to take it from here and isolate it and replace it by essentially this term and this term and the extra term here. So we're going to get from that equation that omega gn z1 i is the sum over a. Maybe I can give a name to this right hand side. This is qgn. So residue when z goes to a, so the one over four, so we have, the, it becomes a one over two. We have to divide by this to isolate delta z w g n. Okay, and then, um, so what do I get? I'm going to get the e minus this half of S omega G and S omega zero one. And this thing which I call Q, which comes with, um, let's see a Q that was a plus and that come with a minus sign. And now using linear loop equations, that has a double zero when z goes to a because this s has a simple zero and this has also has a simple zero. So can this term contribute? Well, this was holomorphic and this was holomorphic, but it can have a zero. Actually, what is this delta z omega zero one? So if I come back to the matrix model case where I had this function, essentially that was the discontinuity of w zero one times dx. So at the end point, the discontinuity does vanish like a square root. So the square root of x minus x a and these, so that was a, to the simple zero and that the x also has a simple zero. So that has exactly a double zero. So that's in the matrix model. And that, that is great because this term I said it has a double zero in the denominator. It also, there's a double zero, so they cancel. We just left with a holomorphic term, so it doesn't contribute to the residue. If I want to make that work in a totally abstract setting, I have to make this assumption here, essentially that 
omega zero one divided by the x does I mean is of order one. At a. So in other words, that d of this is not zero when z goes to a. So it's a technical assumption. So using this, we do have this term that doesn't contribute. And for the q, it's the content of the quadratic group equations. that this has a double zero. So it's also not going to contribute. And so we're left with the formula that omega g n z one i is a sum over a residue that's equal a, a half of, so I'm going to rewrite that explicit, more explicitly, the so delta of g a was this, The delta of omega zero one is this. And the E, we had written it here. So I'm just going to copy it. Here. And because precisely we move here, there was no omega g and omega zero one that only contains omega g prime n prime is two g prime minus two plus n prime smaller than two g minus two plus n. And this is a topological recursion formula. So the time is almost over, isn't it? Yes, but uh, you can take a few minutes to summarize everything. So I can take, if you want, five minutes to, to describe where those blob topological recursion fits in there. Yes, OK. So here we just described, we just took the abstract loop equations. And we say, if we assume this omega gn are normalized in the sense that omega gn is p of omega gn in each variable, then we see there's a unique solution is given by the topological recursion formula. And that's really the form that Ena and Oranta discovered. But now what about the general solution when your solution is not normalized? So you take the same setting, sigma x omega zero one omega zero two is fixed. And let us look at the set of solutions of abstract loop equations. So these abstract loop equations contain linear equation, quadratic equation. So it's a complicated set. But in fact, there's a bijection to a simpler set, which is in fact a vector space of holomorphic forms in n variables on sigma, sigma n, which take a solution, ascend it to phi g n, which is applying this whole, taking this holomorphic part with respect to each variable. So apply this, take holomorphic part in this, take holomorphic part in this. And these are called the blobs. The theorem, which we proved with Shadrin 
is that phi is a bijection. And somehow we already know what is phi inverse of zero when you just take the zero holomorphic form for each gn. Because that's the case where the solution is normalized. So it's given by topological recursion. On the other hand, if I want to take here a collection of blobs, an arbitrary one, that can be written as a sum over graphs, or bipartite graphs. So essentially there's five vertices, the blobs, and there's omega zero vertices, which are given by usual TR. So then obtained from normalized solution. And you can express a general solution from the normalized solution and its blocks. That's the content of this theorem. So the weight is applied in matrix models. So here we have a matrix model, which is defined by all its THKs. And under good circumstances, well, there is going to be a larger limit. So there's a spectral curve. This we explain how to get it from the double from the correlation function in the larger limit. And in fact, if there's only T01 and T02, which is the case which I mainly explained, then I say that the solution you want is normalized, so all the blobs are zero. Otherwise, there are non-zero blobs for all GN in general, and they can be obtained recursively. from the omega g prime n prime before gn and the thks also in lower topology. So there's a formula here, which I didn't explain, uh, which is a bit heavy, but it exists. And so to a multi-trace matrix model, in summary, you can attach a spectral curve and in case you had more than double traces, uh, you also attach a collection of blobs. Now, what we're interested in is the large and asymptotic expansion, which at least in the one cut case, uh, one can do, or the formal matrix model point of view where these Topological expansion were given for free. So in both cases, we had topological expansions of this form. So here there is TR or blob TR, if you have the non-zero blobs and you get a collection of omega GNs. And the relevance for us is that we then get our WGN by saying that actually this is just turning the W, uh, turning the Ws which we have here, the functions to differential forms.
up to a shift for the zero two because it needed to have this double pole property and that's what made it work. So this is a summary. And what I can maybe stress is in this derivation, which we did for the normalized solution, the miracle is that we got, we, when we wrote Schrodinger as an equation, there were these polynomials, which we didn't know that were expressed in terms of the correlation function we're looking for. And with these tricks, essentially we managed to get rid of this unknown polynomial and the Schrodinger-Nelson equation via the loop equation give you a recursive information on the polar part of, on the divergent part of the omega GNs. And it is because you have that and Cauchy residue formula, so the normalization property, that you could reconstruct the function just knowing this and ignoring those unknown polynomials. Because they don't contribute to the divergent part. So this is the, the structure of the string and equation, which makes this possible. And here I try to outline the key mechanism that leads to the topological recursion formula, which is a bit special when we first see it, um, but really come from this uh, analytic continuation analysis. And this is the end, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Was a great overview. Thanks a lot. Do we have questions? So uh, related to your last comment, Gaetan, I mean, so shouldn't it still we guess the number of cuts in order to start the process? So you have to, in all of this problem, the first task is to compute the spectral curve. Yeah. As we have seen, the spectral curve is given by, so there's essentially two ways, either you write the leading order of the first string that's an equation, then you get this nonlinear equation. Yes. Um, or you approach it more from the probability perspective and potential theory. Yes. And it's this Phileas transform of the equilibrium measure, which is a maximizer of the energy functional. Yes. yes. And so it's solution of a certain riemann hilbert problem. Yes, yeah. As soon as you have T0 to non-zero, so double trace or high, I mean, double trace, what happens is that the riemann hibbert problem becomes non-local. Yeah. There's these contour integrals. And as soon as you have more than double trace, the riemann hibbert problem becomes non-linear. Yeah. So of course, it's a huge task to solve this, to find, in fact, a unique solution of this problem, riemann hibbert problem uh, that is specified by uh, the bound, I mean, the condition that you have. And it's, so it's very difficult to compute the spectral curve in general. Yes. Very often what you do that you, you make assumptions. Yeah. Uh, that there is this number of cuts. Yeah. Or you say the coefficients in the T's are not too big. So we, yeah. just a perturbation of the Gaussian. In that yeah. case, there are theorem telling you you remain one cut. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Gaetan. It's Jamie Mingo here. Hi. So, could uh, it seems that there's something different that happens when g equals zero, n equals one. Do we have that one over mm -hmm. x one minus x or n equals two? Excuse me. Or, yeah, yes. maybe n equals one. I can't remember. And then it doesn't appear in any of the other ones. And you gave a little reason about some branch cut. Something happens. Could you say that again? What 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 was the explanation? Yeah, so that, there it was. Yeah, how did that the, go? The claim is better seen here in the shrink lesson equations. If you are in the so simple or double trace matrix model. When you look at the discontinuity of the Schrodinger-Nelson equation, you get this type of equation, which are linear in the WGN, and the right-hand side is non-zero only for zero, one, and zero, two. Uh -huh. As soon as you go to the higher, I mean, uh, T03, T04, and so on, then the right-hand sign becomes non-zero for any GN. Okay. And that's more or less responsible for these blobs. 
Okay, so, um, so another question, it's a little bit different. Yeah, so when you, in that picture just above there, mm -hmm. you use the transformation X equals uh, Z plus one over Z, right? Yes. Which is just the Cauchy R transform for the semicircle law. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that these, on each interval, you're assuming some kind of semicircle distribution over your cover? No, not at all. Um, I see. So but why does that it, one do something? It's an accident that the spectral curve for the semicircle, so let's get rid of A and B. Let's just assume that uh, A is, a, a is a, what, minus two, B is two. Yeah. So then X is just going to be this. Right. And then W is your one of X is actually one over Z. Um, so in that case, the variable Z, which uniformizes your curve, happens to be just a simple rational function of the W01 of the CBS transform, or the Cauchy transform, if you want. Uh -huh. It's not anymore the case as soon as your model is not Gaussian, you have your higher order terms. So you okay. just get the parameterization, but the uniformizing variable Z is not directly a single valued function of the W01. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for a great series of talks too. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe this. Um, do we have an intuitive explanation why so many examples can be rephrased into this language? So first, um, so that's the part I didn't give so much detail. So I tried to convince you in the first lecture that any unitarily invariant matrix model um, which has a top, which can have a topological expansion must be of this form with a THK. And, and then this analysis uh, tell you that you always by analytic continuation with good assumption on analyticity here and there, always imply these abstract loop equations. So yes, but there's, there's far more. Always blob topological recursion at least. Um, if you have multi-matrix models, so several matrices, I also tried to convince you on the first lecture um, that you can integrate, uh, integrate out all of the matrices except one. I did that for the two matrix model. And you would end up with a one matrix, with a one Hermitian matrix model of the type which I described, so multi-trace in general. So this is a moral reason why whenever you deal with Hermitian random matrices, whatever model they come, probably it's reasonable, you're going to end up on at least blob topological recursion. Um, there's another reason, in fact. So these uh, abstract loop equations, they can be reinterpreted as uh, Vera Soro constraints uh, in a certain CFT living on a spectral curve. So these ubiquity of TR and abstract loop equations, uh, you can directly see it from the ubiquity, at least in physics, of conformal field theory uh, within quantum field theories. Okay, so it's thanks. A manifestation of this, mm -hmm. and and that can be made precise in the sense, uh, TR allows you to construct some modules for a certain VOAs. And the constraint defining the module are exactly these abstract loop equations in the simplest case of essentially a, a direct sum of Vera Soro algebra at central charge one. Okay, thanks a lot. Other question from the Zoom audience? Okay, then uh, we thank you again for a great lecture series. Thanks. I hope you had a good time in uh, in in person in Western Ontario. Thank you so okay. Much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So we resume at two local time, and we complete our permutation. Daniel. Thanks.